Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, the second episode of our webinar to interview our most influenced firm of the future in Canada. So, um, first episode we deal with Tanya Hills. If anybody missed the first session, uh, you can always go to the YouTube channel. I will send you the link to rewatch the whole uh, video. So today we have Bob, in who somebody who doesn't know him. He was the West Coast Firm of the Future winner in Canada last year. <laughs> so Jennifer Moore was the East Coast winner, and he's the, the West Canadian Coast winner. winner. <laughs> <laughs> so the two Canadians, uh, one in West Coast, one in East Coast. So Bob is the West Coast king of QBO, just so you know. <laughs> and um, today uh, we just wanna uh, have more uh, people to get to know his firm because uh, we all heard about his name, but not so many people really know how did it started because he's pretty young as a business owner, has uh, multiple offices. I'm jealous because uh, I'm much older than Bob, but he is already much more successful as a business owner. <laughs> So I just want to know his secrets. How did he do that? And uh, as far as I know, he used to work like us in the corporation, but uh, he started his business. So um, that's the whole uh, story we're going to tell you today. So before I officially start, uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Jesse Bo. I work at Intuit Canada as a account manager right now for British Columbia. So I normally uh, contact all the bookkeepers and accountants in the West Coast in BC. That's why uh, I'm interview Bob. So all the West Coast people get to know him to know how did he, how did he become a firm of future. And uh, I've been with Intuit for four years. I used to work with the uh, East Ontario Territory. Now I start work in BC. And uh, this is our second episode. We are going to do a weekly webinar with different guests. So hopefully you are joining us. If you miss this one, next one I will uh, post on the social media about the next guest. So off you go, Bob. Okay, so I guess I'll start with a bit of introduction about me and, and legacy. I'll, I'll share my screen. So okay, I'm just I'll stop kick, mine. Kick yep. you off. Here. So, Okay, hopefully uh, people can see my presentation here. Oh, so that's my baby. <laughs> yeah, so uh, our firm's called Legacy Advantage. Uh, we are a CPA firm, but we only do bookkeeping. Um, and yeah, on the personal side, this is my little baby, Elizabeth. Uh, she's trying to learn how to play pool. This is uh, my wife and I and baby Lizzie. And this Can I is ask a little uh, bit gossip. Okay. <laughs> How did you meet your wife? How did I meet my wife? Uh, we <laughs> were uh, at a Christian club together at UBC called Campus for Christ, called uh, Power to Change Now. And I was the uh, treasurer. She was the administrator. We had some office romance. And uh, wow, that, uh, really? Yeah. Let, let you. Let you. You never told us. You never told us that. That's you a, never asked, Jesse. <laughs> well, I feel I figured I should ask her today, so everybody knows. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so this is uh, one of my favorite pictures of uh, Lizzie. Very cute. So um, you know, we are a bookkeeping firm and we are a CPA firm, but uh, but our vision is to uh, become the most trusted and competent bookkeeping company in Canada and eventually uh, the world. Uh, we started in 2015. Uh, now we have two offices, 20 staff, 1 million in sales, and next year we have plans to add two locations in Alberta. Um, and uh, runner-up, <laughs> I was runner-up for From the Future in, uh, in 2016, and it was awarded for our ability to leverage technology to add a unique uh, perspective of value to our clients. We've also had a uh, blogs and publications and features in Small Business BC, Surrey 604, Small Business Trends, BC Business Magazine, and also the Firm of the Future blog. 
Um, and you can find us on find an accountant. So uh, Jesse thought this could be a really interesting uh, uh, item to add to this presentation. But basically, you know, the, the formula for uh, optimizing your SEO on find an accountant is to make sure you have your QuickBooks Online Advanced badge, your QuickBooks Desktop badge, and uh, get more than nine reviews, and you can be top of the page here. This is our article in uh, BC Business Magazine. That was awesome. Uh, a lot of friends called me up or texted me and said, hey, uh, you know, saw you in the magazine, really cool. Uh, so that was a really interesting opportunity. Now, when I say bookkeeping, um, I really mean bookkeeping plus, but it's really hard for me to explain to clients what we mean by bookkeeping plus or CPA level bookkeeping. And, and so we, 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 you know, our, our core business, we just want to differentiate ourselves by doing more than just data entry. And the brand that we promise our clients, the brand promise is basically peace of mind, clarity, and financial intelligence. Peace of mind, clarity, and financial intelligence. So what do those mean? Uh, quick example, you know, uh, with peace of mind, we have a client named Kaylin, Kaylin and Hobbs. Uh, the problem is that uh, both partners are uh, not, Canada, not from Canada. They were uh, U.S. investment bankers, and they wanted to uh, grow a business in Canada, so they want to get peace of mind. So we help them sign up on GST, PST, WCB, uh, payroll, and that kind of stuff, and now they have peace of mind to build their pickerel empire. Um, what I mean by clarity is giving our business owners the visibility into their business. So we have a client who's a $4 million specialty retail. They have a bistro, a gym, and a clothing store all in the same space. And so we do things like uh, uh, you know, department costing, uh, class reporting, all that kind of stuff, uh, so that they have the visibility in how each business line is doing. We also have a client that uh, we offer what I call financial intelligence. Uh, they're an eleven million dollar uh, walk-in clinic with multiple locations, and they have a very difficult time dealing with MSPs, doctors, very complex payroll, multiple locations. Now, for those guys, we actually don't do any bookkeeping. Rather, we're acting like um, part-time controllers, where we would review the, the work being done and then generate financial reports for their investors and their um, lenders and things like that. So. You know, that's what I mean by, um, you know, uh, peace of mind, clarity, and financial intelligence. And this is our tagline, how can bookkeeping be your advantage? So that's a bit about um, me and my firm. So um, I find very interesting is um, how did you think about you want to do a just bookkeeping firm? Like lots of people is um, multiple service firm. So why did you choose only do the bookkeeping? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a good question. So I saw, I saw, I used to work at KPMG and I saw two opportunities. One is that uh, people have a hard time finding good quality uh, bookkeepers, uh, generally speaking. So that made it really difficult. Um, it, it was a lose lose situation across the board for, you know, the client, uh, the accountant. And so it was just a bad experience. And the second opportunity that I saw is that there's no brand. Uh, that people can recognize uh, in, in the space of bookkeeping. So for example, if someone needs an auditor, okay, they think about the big four. If someone needs a tax return, they think about, oh, okay, let's go to H&R Block or whatever. If someone needs a bookkeeper, there's no brand. And um, the people, you know, the, the, the way that people still find refer, uh, bookkeepers is still through referrals. That's the main source, of, main, main way of, of finding bookkeepers. And so that's, those are the opportunities that I, that I saw and you know what? I, I read a book called uh, Good to Great. And in there, I talked about the hedgehog concept. And one of the questions you need to ask yourself when, when building a business is, what can you be in the best in the world at? What can you be the best in the world at? You don't have to be the best in the world now, but you have to be best in the world eventually. And so I asked myself, look, I just got my CPA. I'm never going to be the best at audit. There's already five people vying for that title. Oh, sorry, five, five firms vying for that title. Um, I can never, never be the best at tax. You know, those, those five firms plus h and Block, they have that, that, uh, that market corner. Um, but I asked myself, who's really known for being the best at bookkeeping? There's no name. And so, therefore, I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strive for that spot. I'm going to brand ourselves and, and just fight for that top spot and and define ourselves as being the best 
and bookkeeping, and eventually we can get there. So, so that's one of the reasons why I chose to go down that route. And and I guess the other reason is is that um, you know accountants for the most part don't want to do bookkeeping, and um, and so I thought, okay, instead of starting a traditional CPA firm that does taxes, uh, then I then I'd be a competitor to all the other accountants. If I start a bookkeeping only firm, then all of a sudden, the thousand accountants in Vancouver become my referral partners and not my competitors. So that's you know those are kind of the con that's kind of the context behind why we decided to focus on just doing bookkeeping. So uh, when you um, still working in the big four, the KPMG, how many years uh, you work for them? Yeah, I was I literally was uh, thirty months and done. Uh, Really? Basically, yeah, you need you need thirty months of experience, and in month twenty nine, I gave my notice. I uh, say, look, I get my hours on the sixteenth of July, and I'm I'm leaving on the eighteenth. So <laughs> I was so excited so to get you, out there. So were you prepared? Because for me, if I were you, twenty something, just got my first job in the big four, a lot of people will be so jealous. Oh my God, you got such a decent job. How did you find out? you have that courage, like even think about quit your job because that's a huge thing for most people just to get over that one step. So how did you find your courage? How did you think of yourself, the whole plan to become a business owner of yourself? Did you yeah. prepare for it? Well, um, yeah, there's a whole lot of things. I mean, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, so entrepreneurship was, wasn't, there's some feedback um, entrepreneurship wasn't very scary for me because I watched my dad and I watched the struggle and and the reward that that came from it. So and right right in that way, I, I got a bit of support uh, men mentally. Uh, I guess the second reason is I really appreciate my parents for raising me super super well. And um, at the end of the day, you know, I had the confidence in knowing that if I stepped out and I failed, um, I won't be homeless. You know, I have a foundation. Uh, if I lose everything. I can go go live with my parents, uh, so that's been awesome. My wife, amazing. You know, she she believed in me. She said, "Look, let's let's do it," and oh, uh, and she's awesome. okay. Is she here? Well, <laughs> <I hope she's laughs> no. <laughs> she's probably in the other room listening to this webinar. No, um, she uh, she said, "Look again." She agreed with me. Like I, she said, "I trust you, Bob." And if, if we really fail, we can go live our, with our parents for a while. And and part of it, is, I think, is that also really good having a CPA because honestly, like if I did fail, I could go find a job anywhere, anytime, right? I can, I can go back to, to a big firm anytime. So that's not a big, uh, scary um, jump. I, I, it's, it's not as scary as some, some people think. And, and then the other, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is, you know, my my grandparents, they say they're, they're, they were in China and they saved their entire lives and, and they saved $70,000 Canadian dollars. Now, Wow. It's, it's not a lot, but it's, but it's a lot. Like it's their life savings, right? Um, yeah. And that's the legacy that they have left me. And I thought, look, seventy thousand dollars, I could buy a car, I could invest it. But I, th I think, like, why did they save their entire lives? They saved their entire lives to give me a leg up, right? They saved me. A, they saved their entire lives to give me an opportunity to uh, for, like this. So basically, I just took the seventy thousand dollars plowed into the business, that is our one year salary. And I basically said, look, we have one year to give this a shot. And uh, if it doesn't work out, I go back to find a job. Well, that's one way to do it. Well, um, how many, um, how, do, how do I say this? Before you actually start running your business, uh, did you do a lot of research, how to start a business? What's your business plan? How did you plan the whole thing out to make sure you don't fail? Yeah, uh, I mean, the business plan honestly is is uh, is very simple. Do bookkeeping, don't do taxes. <laughs> do good work. Um, and but I think I it it definitely took a lot of. I I did, I did write a business plan, and in that business plan process, I decided that you know what you know what we're never gonna hire, we're never gonna do taxes. Um, I taught, had a marketing plan in place, which. Step one is basically talk to all the accountants in town and see what they say. Um, yeah, th I would say there's definitely planning, a lot of planning involved. Honestly, like the last year I was at a big firm, I was 
you know, kind of there in body, but not in spirit. And like, you know, I was listening to audiobooks, I was listening to podcasts, I was listening to interviews to other entrepreneurs, just getting myself ready into the mindset of just hustle from day one. So uh, when you choose to become a bookkeeping firm, when you want to uh, work with the accounting software company, um, why did you pick QuickBooks? Yeah, so that was, uh, that was interesting. So yeah, in, in the beginning, um, I honestly, I, I just wanted to create a firm that I want to be a part of. And I think that made a huge difference in our HR policy that we can, we can get into later as well. But one of the things I wanted to have in my job is um, autonomy, is have the ability to control where I work, how I work. As long as the result is there, then I get to control my own schedule. And so I want to enable my staff to do that. And the only way we could do that is if we have a cloud-based solution. So in, in that moment, I think there were three cloud options. One is uh, QuickBooks Online, uh, Sage One, and Zero. And obviously, we have the remote desktop option as well that we looked into. Um, and, I, and I thought, okay, Zero, it's, it's, it looks pretty good. It's a bit expensive. It's, I think, New Zealand or Australian. And it didn't really have a big following in, in Canada. Sage One, and like at that time, it was just a joke. Like it, it was a joke, um, and the QuickBooks Online was um, was a joke as well. No, it had it had a lot of it was a lot of <laughs> I, I just want to know which year was that? Is that 2015 <laughs> or 2000, 2015? Oh, I remember now. I remember I have a call with you. Yeah. Uh, over the phone, you were calling like, oh, how can I set up this uh, on my uh, fifty percent off? Because back then we didn't have this um, PBOA, so called hotel right. billing. We only offer the first year discounted pricing, right? And then I remember it was Jerry was one of your yeah. employee called in. Yeah. And yeah. I was the sales rep at the small business session. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, Bob, we have to sign now 50% now. You got one year. <laughs> so that was when you just started your QBO journey. Exactly. When we just started. Exactly. So anyway, it was it was a really it was a good product. I had a lot of kind of uh, holes, but you know what software doesn't. Um, but anyway, and I thought QuickBooks Desktop had a huge following in Canada already, and the transition from desktop to online is seamless. So uh, that made it a huge uh, reason of why we chose to commit to only one software. Um, now I just I want to make a note that I know some firms you know sometimes do Sage, sometimes do QuickBooks, sometimes Desktop, and my, I guess my advice for people that, are, that have diversified their toolkit is, uh, is to not do that. Cho choose one, stick with it, because there's so much to learn, so many workarounds, so many product improvements that you need to keep up with, that if you spread your energy too thin, um, you're not gonna be an expert in anything, right? So, so we, we deny clients that use Zero, we don't take clients that use Sage, and we have a Sage subscription, but it's only for the purpose of transitioning to, them to online. And so as a result, because we committed to one software, one system, uh, we're very, very knowledgeable in, in that software. Well, wow, that's true. So uh, uh, when you started to uh, onboarding the QBO clients, because you are owning cloud bookkeeping, uh, how was the conversation with your clients? You tell them, hey, we are only doing uh, QBO. So how did you um, get the clients who are going to uh, have cloud based that's most of people are struggling with because when they talk to the client they all say oh I would prefer to have a desktop installed on my computer I have a USB key save all my data in there I feel more comfortable that way so how was your conversation when you're onboarding clients uh, if that was a conversation I would have said no thanks see you later um, I don't see honestly I've never I don't think I've ever had that conversation uh, may, maybe one, and we just kind of left it there. Um, yeah, I, I honestly don't remember having that conversation. I think for the most part, it's just a matter of showing them the benefits of online. So, um, you know, one of the benefits I would say is that you have much more visibility, right? So one of our, one of our brand promises is clarity, peace of mind, and then clarity. Well, the way for you to have clarity is for you to have access to the reports. So if I can give you real-time access to the reports, and you, just, you can just log in at any point in time, like, why, why wouldn't you want to, right? And, but but that, that being said, there are some clients that need that desktop because, because it's integrated with a, 
you know, a, a different app or yeah, a different solution. You know, they have to use desktop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In that case, we just say, look, we're not a good fit. Actually, we've had we've had that uh, happen. Uh, there was a one eight hundred got junk franchise that used uh, that that required them to use desktop because their web application synchronizes with desktop and desktop only. And we just said, sorry, we we don't do it. I guess uh, in a good way, um, when you have your website completely indicate your firm is only cloud, or well, for those clients who is not interested in any kind of a cloud solution, they will not even contact you. So for those leads you get from the website, from your social media, from your business page, the most people already read all your firm's uh, service. When they contact you, they they kind of default, they want to go ahead with the cloud accounting, I think. Yeah, I, I guess so. Right, when you design your web page, I really like your uh, company website. It's very clear and nice and clean with all your team members, everybody's happy. <laughs> and uh, very, very strong message about your platform is the cloud. So I, mm -hmm. I'm assuming whenever the client do a research, looking for a bookkeeping firm, they see your website, they commit to it, they feel like I want to contact Bob. They sort of default, they want to go with you with the cloud. So they never, uh, encourage to them for those clients. Oh, this is not for me. They go ahead. They just contact somebody else. They did, never, you know, never even bother to come to you. Cloud or not cloud, I don't think, I don't think that's a really big hurdle. Uh, for the most part, clients just want a solution. Like they don't care if you use desktop or online or or anything like that. They just want a good solution. And basically, our solution is a is a quick look solution. And if they choose to use our solution then they're okay with switching to the, switching the software. So um, which year did you start um, Legacy? 2015. 2015? And uh, how many employees do you have right now? Uh, I have uh, 20 staff. 20 staff? Wow, since when? I, last time I heard was like 10? <laughs> yeah, you know, we, ha we staffed up for September. Uh, you know, oh every God. September, September is a really, really a busy month for us because people are back from holidays. They want to get their, you know, books in order. So we get a lot of leads in, in September. Okay. So uh, you are opening two offices in uh, Alberta? Yeah. Um, so, you know, my, my plan is to kind of have offices all over Canada and you know, it, you know, in two years we've built uh, a BC to, to be about a million dollars, well, to, to be a million dollars. And I thought that that is a proof of concept that we have something special here that we can duplicate in other provinces. And uh, just recently I uh, went out to Edmonton and Calgary and just saw that, uh, you know, the same problem, same opportunity exists um, in, in lack of a brand that people can recognize in, in, in the world of bookkeeping. So I talked to a lot of accountants and, uh, you know, a couple of MMP partners, MMP partners, they, they said, look, we, if you come here, we'll refer to you right away because uh, there's not a real scalable bookkeeping solution that like the MNP partners are comfortable in referring to. So anyway, we're going to, we're going to uh, basically expand to uh, Calgary and Edmonton at the same time. And I'm actually going to be moving there to open up our offices um, and the, the reason why I'm going to move there and commit there for a year or two, two years is because uh, our company culture is so key to where we, uh, where we are and where we're going to go. So it's really hard to train culture without physically being there. And uh, that yeah. being said, you know, another shout, shout out to, to my wife uh, to, willing, to be willing to sacrifice one or two years and, and move with me, uh, basically uproot our entire family and, and commit to a new market. So your whole family is gonna to move to Alberta, either yeah, Calgary exactly. or Edmonton. Wow, that's a commitment. Yeah, th thank thankfully our our church is actually setting up a church plant in in Calgary, so we'll we'll have a bit of a fam familiar feel, uh, at least have a, a community to start with in Calgary. Wow. So um, when you uh, start your team, when you start your legacy at the beginning, um, how did you uh, find the right employee? who's already um, in a mindset to be all cloud and how did you train them? Yeah, that's a funny story. I, uh, I made a lot of mistakes, so it cost me a lot awesome. of money. 
That's why um, I want to know from you, you yeah. know, all those mistakes. So other people don't make the same mistakes. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, right, right off the bat, you know, I basically had $70,000 to play around in my business and I wanted to, I wanted to uh, just drive this thing home right away. So I hired an employee uh, right off the bat, which is my friend, Jerry. Um, he, uh, he finished accounting. Uh, he's very tech savvy. Um, but he, you know, he's not very independent. So basically when I brought the business in, we worked on the file together. He spent a lot of time figuring things out and that, that worked really well. And then we had to hire, you know, employee number two, three. Um, and then in those moments, um, you know, I, I always, in leadership books, I always heard the term hire for fit, train for skill, you know, hire for cultural fit and then train them for skill later. But at, at that moment, I was so busy. I was, you know, I had went to a networking event at six o'clock, had coffees at nine, 10, 11, lunch meeting, you know, maybe an hour break at the office, two o'clock meeting, three o'clock meeting, four o'clock networking event, and then to 6 p.m. networking event until nine o'clock. I was, I was just hustling so hard in, the, in those months. So I literally had no time to train people on how to do the work. So I thought, hey, let me hire someone experienced and uh, just do the work for me. Unfortunately, QBO is very, very new. So uh, I basically hired people that knew QuickBooks Desktop, but had, didn't know anything about online. That was such a big mistake because desktop and online, they're so different, right? Like even a bank, a bank fee, like matching adding, matching and adding, it's, it's a totally, completely different concept. So anyway, I hired them and uh, I didn't really have time to review until you know, a month, two months into their employment. And when I took a look at their work, like, it was, it was, it was so messy. Um, basically, I, I halted all of my sales efforts. I was in the office all the time. I didn't meet anybody just to fix their work. And you know, I let them go. And then I hired. The next time I hired, I hired for fit, cultural fit. They knew nothing about QuickBooks Online, and I, they were fresh out of school. And I trained them from ground one on how to do actually do the work. It required a lot more time. So I think you know. With the wasted wages, um, you know the time that I didn't, that I time that I didn't go networking, and the, the time that I had to pay new people to fix old people work, old people's work. Um, I think I wasted about fifteen thousand dollars in the span of two, wow. two three months. So um, it was a very very expensive mistake. And now we have an incredible hiring process that's based on the book Top Grading by Brad Smart. Uh, I have it actually. <laughs> Wow, that's great. Top Get it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. It's basically uh, saying that you need to define what an A player means to you because for every, di different, every single company, A player means different things to different people. So step one is defining what that is. Step two is putting together structure on how to assess for that and then finding them and eventually training them to be your superstars. Well, you will be happy to know. Uh, I, I'm not sure what you know of. Uh, we Intuit, we started the educational program. So we have the accountant and bookkeeper who's already a teacher in the college. They are going to start teaching QBO instead of just the QuickBooks desktop or nice. Sage desktop. So I will maybe introduce you to a few of these uh, bookkeeper and accountant. Maybe Great. they have some students just graduated QBO and they're looking for a job, maybe you can offer them some kind of a subcontractor position. If they're good enough, maybe you can uh, upgrade them or promote them to be your full-time employee. Who, who knows? <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. I'm really glad you guys are taking that step because, um, yeah, it's definitely, you know, that's, that's a trend, right? So having, educating these students on, on new software and the new generation is really important. Okay, so uh, what's your um, next step after you open all these uh, different multiple offices in Canada? You still uh, only offering the bookkeeping. I know you will be super busy since uh, the big partner like MMP already mentioned they want to refer all the clients to you. So after you get so much referral and business, what's your plan to make you sure you are on track and even much better than? Uh, you expect it. So, what's your uh, future plan uh, eventually? 
Um, you are go, I mean, going to open like uh, 20 offices across Canada? <laughs> uh, I don't think Canada needs 20. Uh, we, you know, basically BC, Fraser Valley, Edmonton, Cal Calgary, and then the next plan would be Ontario. We can open up four there uh, and then down to the U.S. Oh, the U.S. So, and then once we, uh, once we have U.S., we can go to U.K. and Australia. The good thing about doing bookkeeping only is it allows us to go cross borders a lot easier because we don't necessarily need to be tax experts in those areas. Wow, that's so uh, huge. I hope I can witness all that in the next uh, maybe 10 years. <laughs> yeah, maybe. It, it's funny. Someone says, uh, someone during, during, during the interview, one of the uh, candidates actually asked me what my five-year goal is. And I said, honestly, I don't know what my five-year goal is. I know where my 50-year-old goal is. Like, I know where, I, where, I know where we're going to be in 50 years. Um, but I don't, because we're growing so fast, I actually don't know where we're going to be in five years. Um, so that was kind of funny. Well, uh, I hope you uh, keep up because I don't want you to suffer some kind of a growing pain. <laughs> Oh, it, it's gonna it's gonna happen for sure. Yeah. So um, right now, I want to know more about uh, more about your current existing uh, client base. What's your majority of the client industry? Yeah. So we focus a lot on uh, nonprofits, uh, the technology sector, and uh, construction and trades. Uh, and that, and the, the common theme across all of those industries is just complex bookkeeping, right? Nonprofits have a charity, uh, sorry, nonprofit standard of accounting, um, you know, uh, tech, tech, tech companies and, and e-commerce, you know, they, they have cross-provincial sales, multi-currency, um, you know, different product lines, and, and sometimes they have investors, so you're dealing with uh, preferred shares, uh, options, all, all those kind of things that, that that our CPA experience can really come in and add value. And then um, construction and trades, they're really, really bad at record keeping. So then we can add a lot of value in, in, in helping them get their books together. Not to mention, we can do things like job costing, uh, project costing that really adds a lot of financial intelligence to their uh, business. That's great. You know, so I think on that note, I want to just expand that. You know, when I talk to a lot of accountants and bookkeepers, their default is saying, yeah, we service anybody. <clears throat> and, you know, when you say you service anybody, you, it means that you service nobody. Um, it's, it's hard for people to understand or refer to you when you don't have a specific niche. So, you know, in, 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 in our case, like, we don't exclusively serve nonprofits. We don't exclusively serve technology clients or construction and trades. If a restaurant client comes in, we'll take them, you know. But when you're communicating in a scenario like this, let's say you're meeting with an accountant and they're like, who's your ideal client? It's so much easier for you to just give them one or two or three uh, industries for them to help you look instead of saying, yeah, we'll take anybody. Then it's like, oh, well, I don't really know how to refer this guy, right? So That's having, a really good point. You know, yeah, in those circumstances, less is more. Being focused actually allows you to, uh, to communicate your message uh, better. Well, um so in your charity industry clients, what's the major workflow apps you use together with the QBO? We use HubDoc a lot um, for polling statements. We use Pluto a lot uh, because charities, they have multi-level um, authorizations, or multi-user authorizations. So Pluto basically uh, makes that a lot easier especially in the summertime when, you know, checks need to be signed, you need to find two board members to come to the office to sign checks. And, you know, board members are away, so, right? So nobody gets paid. So having Pluto set up allows them to approve it remotely. That's been awesome. Uh, we have a daycare client that I've recommended, Rotessa. Rotessa is a pre-authorized debit um, platform. And that's been made a huge difference for them because before uh, they'd have uh, pre-dated, uh, Posted in checks and you know, checks would bounce, and it was just a huge administrative nightmare. So, with Rotessa, everybody signs a pre authorized debit agreement, gives a void check, and then the daycare just pulls money uh, on the first of every month. Wow, that sounds great. Um, so, when you talk about the industry, at the beginning of your firm, 
you don't know what kind of industry you want to serve. So what made you make decision? You just want to choose charity to be your major uh, client. Well, it's, it kind of relates to my background. So at KPMG, I worked at the enterprise group and um, I actually did a lot of charity audits. I did a lot of uh, small ones, big ones. And, you know, I, I have a lot of experience in charity accounting. So I thought this is one way that I can add value and one way we can differentiate as well. And, it, you know, not a lot of bookkeepers are comfortable dealing with nonprofit accounting. So that's one way we can differentiate. So always think about, how, you know, how you can differentiate in the market space. In terms of e-commerce and technology, you know, NBC, Vancouver, it's a blowing, you know, it's a market that's blowing up and we want to be part of that, right? We want to be part of that conversation. So we got clients that are venture capital funds. We got clients that are actually tech companies and we basically just service them well so we can get more and more referrals in the local market. And then construction and trades, again, you know, BC has a really booming uh, construction and trades uh, economy. And again, we just want to be part of that conversation. So. So that, that's basically how we chose to focus on these three markets. I see. So at the beginning, you started your firm. Nobody knows you yet. So how did you market your firm to let other people know you, to let the end user uh, find you, to let other accounting firm actually refer to you? How did you market? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of things. You know, there's, there's online, digital, brand building things, and then there's, there's just me. So I think I budgeted 10% of revenues for the first year to spend on marketing. Now that's really ambitious. I would say, you know, first year we did $400,000, which means we spent $40,000 on marketing. Um, that's huge. That's like one person's salary. Right. And mm -hmm. we, you know, as a result, we, we, you know, barely break even for the first year for the most part, because we funneled all that into marketing. And as a result, we have, you know, great SEO, great website, great brand, and all those, <clears throat> all those things. So that takes time to build. And the other side is just me. Like I hustle like a madman. Like I said, uh, you know, I would have meetings at in the morning, coffees throughout the day, lunch meeting, coffees in the afternoon, networking. And that's like day after day after day after day. Weekends, uh, didn't take a holiday. Uh, I still haven't taken wow. a holiday, right? Like, I mean, if you if you think about it, like if you if you just put in the time, you know, don't take a holiday, work seven days a week, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, like how can you not be successful, right? So, you know, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk, he says that you know, ideas are, ideas count for nothing. It's all about execution. And so for me, I just execute it really hard. Um, just hustle a lot, right? Yeah. Wow, you work really hard. So it's not like I see you all the time, just so relaxing. I'm having cafe here, meeting my clients, so relaxing. And it's not like that, right? It's far behind the scene. Before you get to this point, you actually did a lot of hard work. There's well, no weekends, marketing everywhere yeah. to mm. let people know you. <laughs> well, exactly. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm naturally an introvert. So uh, basically through the whole entire process, I, I developed a a mask that I can use at any point in time and to basically just flip it on because I need to, I have to, I have to change. I have to learn how to be sociable and connect with people. And that's just a skill that you, that you gain. Um, and yeah, you know, and yeah, I mean, I have fun. Like I really, really enjoy networking. It's not like I don't, it's just, it's just exhausting. And, but, but you know, I, I do enjoy it. So that's where I meet a lot of amazing tech entrepreneurs and we, we're friends still now. Um, uh, one of our bigger clients came from me going to a lunch networking event at a lawyer's <laughs> office where they talk about patent patent law intellectual property i'm like patent intellectual property okay I'm, I'm i'm interested in learning so i went and i met somebody you just never know so you have to just have to constantly put yourself out there to give yourself that opportunity give um luck is when opportunity and preparedness meet right so if you put yourself out there more then you'll just be more lucky right and then, um, you know, accountants, I basically just Googled all the accounts in the, in the town and say, email like, hey, um, you know, I, I do bookkeeping, you do accounting, let's grab coffee, let's connect, share your story, my story, connect, a, you know, on a human level, uh, and then just keep doing that. <laughs> just a lot of hard work. Okay. Well, another thing I noticed that is you are very, very, like, popular on social media. Whenever I op open up the LinkedIn or 
Facebook or Twitter, you're always on top of my news feed. So how long does it take for you to build up your social media profile? Uh, I, I, I don't think that was intentional. <laughs> um, I guess, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I mean, Facebook, I, I really enjoy Facebook. So I enjoy sharing photos of, of things. Um, and I think one of my, so my, my vision statement for my life is to, uh, be a godly man, uh, who loves his family and help other people achieve success. So that mission statement drives me to build this business, to build a, you know, a business that can help other people achieve success in the same area, same, same arena. Um, you know, I want to leverage social media to basically share my journey, share things that I've been learning. And I think I want to add value to people. I follow uh, Gary Vaynerchuk a lot and, and he says, document, don't create, right? Document, don't create. And I think that's a great advice because a lot of people want to go on social media to create content, but it's, it's so exhausting because you're, you're trying to fake, you know, you're trying to, trying to be someone fake. But for me, like, I'm just kind of documenting things, sharing things I'm learning, making mistakes and, and then sharing my mistakes on a blog or whatever. And I just think that's, that's fun for me. I like to be vulnerable with people. Um, so that, that's kind of on the, on the content side. And then obviously I have a very beautiful wife and a very cute kid. Uh, so I love sharing these photos as well. Wow, I love your uh, blog. So you wrote a few articles for a uh, firm of the future. And um, I really love the idea of uh, you just to give people more advice based on your mistake. Because a lot of people, they don't want other people to know yeah mistakes and uh, what's the downside they did but uh, i really like your openness to uh really let people know your whole journey and you don't really really care about oh yeah i should keep it secret i just want myself successful so i really lo love that about you your blog and all your social media presence right thanks and it's not just i'm i'm transparent with um <clears throat> i guess you guys I'm really transparent with my staff too. Like I tell them I mess up all the time. And I think, you know, I think what makes our firm different is, is again, is, is our culture, right? And it starts from the top. Um, it's that it's the focus on uh, being genuine with people, connecting with people. And if your staff can know that they can make mistakes, then they're going to be more engaged. They're going to be willing to try more things. And the only way that they can know they're allowed to make mistakes is when they know their boss is a mess too. Right. And he's, mm -hmm. he's, um, so that, that just creates a, a much more, uh, strong bond with the people that I wanted to connect with. Well, um, so, uh, we are having a lot of questions. Do you mind we start oh, taking okay. questions from now? Well, because I will sure. keep looking, looking and lots of you ask lots of questions. Uh, so I will start from the top. So first sure. question from, Diane Mueller, she's the um, oh, ICC yeah. president. Hi, Diane. <laughs> she said, how old is Bob? I first met him when he was still in school. <laughs> That's right. So, Diane, I think we met at uh, the Burnaby ABC restaurant. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, I was still in my CPA program. And at that point, I was already dreaming about this this business. And I think, um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, anyway, I th I'm, I'm 28 now. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so young to be a business owner. So uh, the second question is from um, Stephen McLeod. He's uh, one of our account manager for East Coast, uh, PEI, New Brunswick, and uh, he asked questions about uh, what apps do you majorly use in your firm? Like you already introduced the Lump Profit, you use all those. Other than those apps you mentioned before, do you have any other apps you are planning to use or you are currently still um, implement? Um, well, we use Podio as our CRN, P-O-D-I-O. Um, <clears throat> That's been that's been awesome. We use Asana, we use Insightly, uh, but we settled on on Podio. But other than that, we don't use a lot of apps like Hub, you know we use HubDoc, Pluto, or Tessa. Um, we our our perspective is is that 
Um, we, we, we use apps only if it really, really, really helps our clients. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> wow, that's not going to appear well on a webinar. <coughs> Sorry. We have, we have okay. clients that use jo Jobber, and Jobber is a great app for construction and trades and scheduling. But the integ integration is um, really, really poor. So we basically tell the client, look, just use Jobber as Jobber, and then we'll do the accounting on, on our end. So, you know, there's a lot of great apps out there that our clients use. You know, they, they use Novify, they use all those kind of apps, but it's not something that we manage because we don't really uh, go into the integration game too much. So, you know, that's, I guess that's not where we are specializing in. You know, I know some other firms, they, they're all about apps and all about the high tech, and, and that's great. But for us, we focus on um, different things. Okay, so the other question is, um, what's your uh, onboarding process? Like uh, when you have all these apps for a specific industry, so when you first time talk to the client, um, what's your process to uh, show them the package, you charge them uh, until they actually become your client? What's your uh, process? Um, well, <clears throat> Okay, I, I think I first want to define how you mean onboarding. Like if you're talking about, so it, in, in our business, onboarding only happens after the client has signed the engagement letter and okay. we are ready to actually onboard them to be a client, right? Uh, everything before that is sales and marketing. So okay. if you're thinking about, you know, how to sell those apps to the client, uh, I can answer that question. And and the question yes, is, that's and, a, yes. I think that's the major uh, concern for most people they don't know how to sell those oh. solutions combine the apps and tbo to their clients you don't i mean you don't need to sell it like the clients they don't really care what apps to use like i said they want a solution <clears throat> and if your solution includes all those apps then <clears throat> then great if your solution can be just qbo and some procedural changes then that's okay too so I think, you know, our sales process, we, we always have a face-to-face -face consultation and that's where we discover um, all of the, you know, needs and requirements of the client. <clears throat> and based on those needs, we put together a solution that we explain to the client how our solution is going to solve their problem. And this solution just happened to happen to be Hubda. But this solution just happened to be Pluto because they have a problem finding people to sign checks, therefore, let's use Pluto. Or they use Telpay already, but Telpay rests on their computer. So let's use Pluto, and it does exactly the same thing. So <clears throat> it's about framing the, the sale of the app into presenting the solution. That's that's the key. Okay, I see. So when you um, already have the client agree to be your client, do you list all the apps uh, you are using? In their agreement letter, or they just yeah take yeah in our, in our engagement letter we say uh, we're going to use Pluto for this we're going to use uh, Payworks for payroll we're going to use HubDoc to extract statements. I see. So they already know what solution you are using, and uh, they just pay you whatever the whole package uh, built into your firm, and then they they're okay with it. Yep. Okay. So um, do you do the Value pricing package like a Ron Baker uh, implement. Yeah, I, I love Ron Baker, and uh, he's a very very smart man. And I I'm I'm just gonna say I'm not as smart as I'm not smart as him. Uh, <laughs> I honestly I tried I tried the value pricing model. Okay. I just I just couldn't do it. So so we just have fixed fee. Literally, it's just this is our price. Okay. What do you think? Uh, if okay. they want to negotiate, we can talk, right? Uh, but if they say, yeah, then then good. Part of it is also like, how do you make it duplicatable? Like, you almost have to train your people how to do value pricing before they can do the pricing. And it's so hard. So I have two managers. And in order for me to go into Alberta, I have to train them how to propose, how to, how to create proposals and how to price. And it's a lot easier for me to train them on our pricing method Versus like, hey, read this gigantic book, learn about value pricing. 
It's just, it's just, it's just much harder to duplicate. I know it's the right thing to do, but I just, I cannot execute on it. So your model is more like fixed flat rate to your client. That's right. So how did you calculate the package, the amount of money the client has to pay you monthly or yearly? How do you know you're profitable based on what? How do you calculate that to make sure you're profitable? Okay. Uh, that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole other conversation. So, um, okay, our pricing model is actually quite transparent. It's basically if you take the client revenues, drop three zeros, that's our monthly price plus or minus, right? So for example, million dollar client, that's one and six zeros. Drop three zeros, thousand bucks, right? So that's our, that's our price. And then we go up and down based on scope. So for example, it's a thousand, you know, million dollar client, but they want this extra report and their payroll is really complex and you know, this and that. Uh, okay, 1500 bucks. On the other hand, you know, let's say a million dollar uh, restaurant, all their sales are POS, payroll super simple. They have some turnover, so there's some complexity there. Financial reports, very simple. They just want their simple PL. Um, they have no inventory, everything is in cost of sales. Okay, maybe only 750. Right. So I would say that's our that's our um, pricing formula. In terms in terms of how we know we're profitable, okay, so that that yeah, that's that's a tough piece. So we obviously mention we always we always uh, uh, double check the profitability with our associates every single month. Uh, but more importantly, you know, we compensate our staff based on a percentage of revenues. So they have a salary plus they have a bonus on a percentage of revenues. And so that's awesome because it aligns our um, uh, incentives, you know, with the staff and, and legacy. So when the staff feel like they're not being compensated enough, then they will actually raise that uh, problem to us, the managers. And they will say, hey, I'm doing all this work. I'm only getting 15% or 20% or 10% of this much. I really think they should be paying this much. And I think that's so awesome because that's delegating ownership, right? And in order for the firm to grow, we need, we need more people to take ownership of the whole process. So it's not about management determining the profitability of each client. It's actually the associate that's working on the file. They actually tell me if the file is profitable. And then we could get into a discussion around that. So that's kind of how we um, manage pricing and, and manage profitability. Wow, that's great. This is the first time I hear about all this. So I'm glad I asked that question. Whoever asked the question is genius. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, move on to the next question is from Diane Mueller again. Uh, she is uh, asking you is, um, so after you have the client, they say, um, are you really being an advisor just to uh, have them plan their business? Uh, you are become the trusted advisor, just give them the financial report, so shows them how their business is doing, how their business is going to do based on uh, your suggestion in the next fiscal year. So are you being just an advisor or you have to do the day-to-day -day bookkeeping for them as well? Yeah, so let's go back to basically our value proposition. Peace of mind, clarity, financial intelligence. You can't provide financial intelligence unless the client knows what they're looking at. That's the clarity piece. You cannot provide clarity unless you have peace of mind over the quality of the books. <clears throat> and right now, because we're only you know two years old, all of our staff have been with us maybe one, one or two years, and they're still kind of learning. Well, they're, they're getting very, very good at giving peace of mind to our clients. <clears throat> And that's the uh, foundational piece. So right now, the clarity piece and the financial intelligence piece, that's mainly done by the managers and myself. But eventually, we want to push that down to the associates so that the associates can do the bookkeeping and then have a conversation with the client so that they know what they're doing. And then, you know, they start doing the business planning. Now, this is really interesting because uh, we actually have a leadership development program and a financial intelligence program uh, for our staff. So every Saturday, so every, every month, one Saturday, we spend uh, the morning together, together to learn about business, KPIs, how to build something, so that they can bring that context and background and knowledge and apply that towards, apply that towards their clients. Now, it's going to take some time, but that's the direction that we're moving. So right now, basically, the work is done by the associates, the explanation and analysis done by us, but we're constantly training our associates to elevate them 
so they can become those advisors. Wow, that's great. Okay, can you go back to your bookshelf? Somebody want to see the name of the book more clear? <laughs> Top, you... I'll write it. Top grading. Okay. By Brad Smart. <clears throat> okay, that's great. So, uh, move on to the next question. And uh, I want to know: Are you planning to uh, hire some um, French-speaking employee to uh, go through the Quebec market? <laughs> You know what? That's uh, that's totally possible. I, I have, Quebec right now is not part of our plan because I personally cannot lead it. So, you know, if there is a partner of an ambitious person out there that's willing to open up Quebec uh, with me, uh, I'd love to have a conversation. Okay, so you are looking for mostly like a partnership, uh, existing French-speaking Quebec firm. Uh, join you as a partner to help no, I don't. I don't need an together. existing firm. I just need an ambitious yeah. individual. Oh, I see. Or or, an, or a firm, uh, one of the two. So, um, you know, like if I I can do Alberta, Ontario, fine, because general rules are around the same. If we go down to the U.S., I I personally would not be the one opening up that market. I'd, I'd have to have a U.S. partner to help me because I don't know about the local. Uh, rules, right? Yeah, the tax. Same, yeah, the tax same with Quebec. Is Quebec is, is is very different. So I'm not comfortable opening it up. It's not that I'm afraid. It's that I want to provide the best service for our clients, and I and I know that I personally cannot be the one to do the final file review because I don't know the context. So having a, a Quebec partner would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, next question is from our um, bookkeeper in Quebec, uh, Chantal. She wants to know um, what's your advice. If she would like to focus on healthcare industry clients, and uh, how do you market yourself to those clients, and what kind of apps you recommend for those industries? Okay, Chantal, let me just say that uh, we have zero medical professionals. Zero. Um, not sure how it works in uh, Quebec, but in BC, the bookkeeping for doctors is so simple. Basically, the invoice MSP, which is the uh, provincial health authority, that's revenues. They have payroll. They have rent. That's it. So they just cannot justify. Our minimum fee is $350 a month, right? And based on our ratio, let's say a client is, is doing $500,000 a year in billings. We're charging $500 a month, so $6,000 a year. The doctors, <laughs> they're, they're cheap. So they can't justify paying $6,000 for someone to do their bookkeeping, right? So basically, whenever a doctor has inquired of our services, it's never been a right fit. So we have zero medical professionals. Okay, that's the question. And um, Chantal asked another question is about your firm. So she missed the first half of the presentation. Um, she wants to know if you are full service accounting firm hiring full-time employees or you just subcontract uh, and provide CFO services and sell those um, franchises. Yeah. So, so Chantel, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is there on the screen or you can ask Jesse. Uh, we are only bookkeeping. We don't do any tax. We don't do any audits or anything like that. And all of them are employees, full-time, on payroll. We don't hire part-time staff. And we don't hire contractors because it's hard to control quality. And my my perspective is, look, if you're going to hire somebody, if you're going to hire somebody good, you need to commit to them, right? It's a you guys are taking a mutual risk on each other. So my employees are um, my employees are taking a chance on me that I will give them full time employment. I will train them and I will I will take care of them. And I'm taking a chance on them. And I think that's the best way to indicate that trust is just by a full-time employment. Like say, look, I'm gonna invest in you full-time. Don't have to worry about finding another job. Just commit to me. Let's let's work on this together. Let's build a dream together. That's great. Um, so um, the other uh, person wants to know, um, you're very successful nowadays. And uh, did you fail and uh, struggle before you become to this point? Uh, did you mean, before starting legacy? 
Is that? No, uh, at the beginning stage of your booking form, before you get the, all the referral, before you get all the employees, and the, did you fail yeah. at all? Or? Well, uh, I mean, we're, we're still, we're failing right now. Uh, it's a constant <laughs> stage of like failing, standing out, failing. Like our growth was pretty quick. Like month one, we got $5,000 in recurring revenue. So if you extrapolate that, like first month, we built a $60,000 business. Month two, we got $10,000 in revenues. So in month two, we'll build a essentially $120,000 business. Month three, $15,000 in recurring revenues. Month four, uh, $18,000. So like it just grew pretty quick. Um, but th with that, with that speed also comes um, things that break. So to talk about the mistake being hiring the wrong people, right? Um, and then as the as the business started to grow, my uh, Jerry was promoted to the manager level, but he didn't have enough experience. So, so actually the quality control wasn't 100% there. So, you know, 90% of the time, things are fine. But 10% of the time, you know, 5% of the time, things really mess up and the client become really upset. Look, you're building a business, like you're gonna make mistakes. And, and I, I totally acknowledge that. <laughs> In fact, uh, the client just left this morning, a uh, pretty big one, $1,200 a month. And I, I still don't know why. Wow. Is that, I thought we did a good job and I did a file review recently. Everything's fine. So anyway, things happen. So, um, you know, that, that's negative news. The good news is we have a $10,000 pipeline that we need to close on uh, in the next couple of weeks. So there's always good and bad in, in every stage of the business. That's true. Uh, another question is um, some client, they are so like high maintenance. They, they want full attention all the time. Do you provide like a full-time support? Uh, on your package when you do the fixed rate? Um, full time, sorry, pardon me, full time support? So, full time support, like for example, you sign up a client based on the monthly fixed rate. So, do you provide like a full time support over the email, phone call? They call you all the yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. All these you questions, know, that question? Yeah, full, full time. Um, that's, that's definitely, you know, something that, that we provide. But, like, I don't, I didn't provide it very often because most of my staff are, are dealing with that. So they actually um, field all the questions and if they don't know, then they approach me. And, you know, yes, you do have some clients that are high maintenance and basically you, you just need to have a, a, a conversation with them. Say, look, you're using up a lot of our resources and you're, you're calling a lot. Um, either, you know, send them an email and get back to you or look, we have to increase our price. Mm -hmm. That's true. So um, the other question is, um, do you uh, make your client pay weekly, monthly, quarterly, or yearly? Monthly. Monthly on the first of the monthly? month. Monthly? Okay. So first day of the month, they pay whatever the monthly. Yeah, we, we get a pre-authorized debit through Otessa. We set up a recurring billing. Uh, you know, September 1st, money comes out of their bank account. September 10th, it hits ours. Wow, nice. So, um, I have a question. Our, our AR days is 14 yeah. days. Okay. So, 14 days. So, when they pay you uh, first of the day of the month, and then all the money goes into your bank 14 days? Yeah, so 14 days AR means uh, my clients pay me within 14 days. So, I issued an invoice on the first. And most of my money oh, comes okay. in. Oh, okay. You give them 14 yeah. days to pay you. Okay. No, no, no. Um, like AR turnover ratio. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when they when they months. actually put the money in the first of month, you will receive it eventually within those 14 days. That's right. Okay. So the other question uh, from, I think, might be Marjorie's question. Uh, she was more concerned about workflow. So, how do you um, manage your workflow with your client? Say, because your major client is a, a nonprofit, what's your workflow? Make sure you are working very efficiently with the team and the client. I think it's uh, all about managing scope. So, um, you know, in our engagement letter, we have a very detailed description of scope, like. Revenues, who's doing what, expenses, who's doing what, reporting, what do you want, how many bank accounts are we reconciling? And so as long as the clients stay within scope, it's fine. 
but then you get to things like scope creep, right? So that, that we have to manage very, very actively. So, um, you know, we just got to make sure that we, we manage scope creep very well. Sounds good. So that's all the questions for today. Phew, that was a lot of hard questions. I yeah, don't know no how I answer those questions. Good thing I'm not the only person here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I have, to, I have to head off to my next meeting. Okay, so uh, yeah. thank you for today. And uh, I will see you in San Jose and uh, QB yeah. in Toronto if you come over. Sounds good. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, great. So I will stop the recording for now and everybody will get a recording afterwards. Thanks. All right, bye.